Without further ado, <laughs> okay. I give you Eric Curiel. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, everyone says thank you for having me, but I sincerely mean it when I say thank you for having me. This is really a pleasure. Uh, uh, you know, Nick and Chris, I've known, known you guys forever. I've really enjoyed talking with you guys over many years about many things, so I'm, I'm really pleased and flattered that you invited me to give this talk. So I'll be talking today about, well, you can read the title, but I'll, it's completely standard to read the title out loud anyway, Two Paths of the Einstein Field Equation from Horizon Thermodynamics. I'll be talking about uh, Ted Jacobson's and, uh, I always forget Padmanabhan's first name. Anyone remember? It's, it's Tanu, T T Tanu Padmanabhan, thank you. Uh, their, respect, their uh, respective two arguments for, in a sense, deriving the Einstein field equation from thermodynamical assumptions. I think it's a fascinating project. Both of them are fascinating projects. They have both virtues and demerits. As a philosopher, I'll be focusing on the demerits. Uh, so the outline, just since the motivation behind this, the original motivation, and uh, you know, since Ted was the progenitor of this idea back in 95, he explicitly uh, took black hole thermodynamics as his inspiration. Uh, Padmanabhan actually did as well. The very first attempt he made was for spherically symmetric uh, horizons that were essentially uh, uh, essentially short -stilled. So I'll just very quickly re review the basics of black hole thermodynamics. What we need to what what we need to keep in the back of our mind while we're going through their two approaches. I'll review the motivation, the aim, and the context of the two approaches, uh, which they both uh, everything they share, in, everything they share in common, because there is a lot of commonality, at, uh, at least at this level. I'll, at the argument, at the actual, at the level of actually, uh, level of actual argument, they do make different assumptions and have different argumentative strategies. So I'll review Jacobson's argument first, Padmanabhan second. I'll then work, uh, run through what I see as uh, several important technical problems, and I'll, I'll also actually sketch a few possibilities for perhaps trying to uh, deal with them. The uh, possibility, the suggestions I make are very tentative, and uh, well, that, that will be clear when I discuss them. And then I'll conclude by reviewing some, I think, conceptual issues, both, both not, only, not only problematic ones, but also, I think, in, interesting, possibly insightful ones that, uh, that these Pro, that these programs give rise to, and uh, then I guess well Q and A. So uh, you want me to? Just, uh, I was planning on speaking for about forty-five minutes. Can you give me maybe a ten-minute warning? Yes, sure. Is that does that clock work? Yeah. Because it's not actually eleven forty, eleven twenty, is it? It's eleven twenty-two. Oh, good, because your cl your clock here says eleven thirty-five. That's the one that's wrong. Okay. They, they made a different math field. <laughs> The one with, with, with different characteristics, yeah. right? What we were talking about last night. Okay, I, so. I don't know why that one hasn't automatically set to the right thing. It's weird. Okay. So, let's just, so just a very quick outline of the basic uh, concepts and ideas we need from black hole thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, one has the notion of an isolated system. In black, uh, for black holes, the relevant analog is that the, the space-time model containing the black hole is asymptotically flat. That's an idealization that whatever other physical systems there may actually be are far enough away that uh, interactions are so negligible they can be effectively ignored. Ec uh, the idea of equilibrium in thermodynamics, which is sometimes characterized by constancy of temperature or constancy of some other set of physically relevant parameters, is captured for black holes by the idea that black hole is stationary, i.e. there's an asymptotically time-like killing field that is tangent to the horizon, tangent to the event horizon, uh, generally null um, at the horizon, although for Kerr it can be space-like. Remarkably enough, and this already is probably the very first indication that black holes might be, um, one might be tempted to think of them as thermodynamical objects, Stationary black holes, st stationary isolated black holes are completely characterized by just three physical quantities. They're, I'm sorry? Eric, is it possible that sorry on my screen would flip to a thermodynamic black holes? That. In fact, in fact, yes. In, in fact, yes. I, I, I have apparently, 
I've apparently completely randomly mi mi mixed the mixed the ordinary thermodynamics in the black holes. Oh well. So what, wait, I mean, we, we don't we don't use surface gravity to characterize the temperature of ordinary thermodynamical systems. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yes, Chris, thank you, thank you. But so uh, j just in your mind, swap some swap some of the swap some of the rows, uh, swap the columns of some of the rows. So thermodynamics systems are characterized generally. Uh, Ignoring uh, you know fancy stuff like systems with angular momentum and systems with electric charge, they gen you generally need only two parameters to completely characterize an ordinary thermodynamical system, say pressure and temperature, or temperature and volume, or temperature and entropy, or energy and entropy, or energy and volume. Any two will do, as long as one has an effective equation of state that relates uh, the, the two of them to all the others. For black holes, generically, we need exactly three the mass, angular momentum, and electric charge. This is known as the no-hair theorem. And it's incredibly, it's, it's remarkable because one needs these three, these three and only these three, completely irrespective of what matter collapsed to form the black hole. You, know, you could have a couple hundred quadrillion uh, tons of water. You could have uh, just an enormous number of old socks. You could have in Ehrman's wonderful conceit, a whole shitload of televisions showing you know, Nixon's checker speech. It doesn't matter. Once the collapses, once the collapse has happened, the horizon is formed and the horizon has settled down to stationarity. Every black hole is identical with every other black hole that has the same values for those three numbers. This is exactly like thermodynamics. Pressure and temperature doesn't care what kind of underlying matter the uh, that the these the statistical mechanics of the underlying micro degrees of freedom give rise to the exact same macro parameters completely independent of what of any, idiosyncr any idiosyncrasies of the actual underlying matter fields. And so that already makes black holes can smell very thermodynamical. Uh, the te ordinary temperature in thermodynamics is given by surface gravity and ordinary entropy, uh, the correlate is the area. And recall the laws of black hole, the laws of black hole mechanics or laws of black hole thermodynamics, depending on how one feels about it. The zeroth law, surface gravity is constant over the event horizon, stationary black hole. So this, this is one reason why th this begins to suggest that surface gravity really plays the physical world temperature. The change, uh, first law, change in the mass equals surface gravity times change in area plus the rotational work. And now it's really being look thermodynamical because the left-hand side mass just is the same as the left-hand side of the first law in ordinary thermodynamics. It, relativistically, mass is energy. And the angular work term, the rotational work term, is identical to the same term in, in thermodynamical systems that do, include rotation, that, that do include rotational energy. And so it looks like what we have left is this heat term that, that if one takes surface gravity again to be temperature uh, and interprets it as a Gibbs term, then area should be entropy. That is uh, buttressed by the second law, the, the Hawking's area theorem, the area of an event horizon never decreases in any physical process. And again, the interpretation of surface gravity as temperature is buttressed by the third law, that extremal black holes, surface gravity equals zero, is not achievable by any physical process. So that's basically all the all the background that we need to keep, uh, that we need to have uh, in the back of our heads while we're working through uh, Jacobson's and Padmanabhan's arguments. So there's a really lovely quote that Ted has at the beginning of his of the seminal 1995 paper where he first proposed this project. The four laws of black hole mechanics, which are analogous to those of thermodynamics, were originally derived from the classical Einstein equation. With the discovery of the quantum Hawking radiation, it became clear that the analogy is in fact an identity and by that I take it he means the laws of black hole mechanics really are the laws of ordinary thermodynamics extended into, the, into a new regime in the same way that at the end of the 19th century the ordinary laws of thermodynamics were extended into, into the regime of, electro, of electromagnetism to account for black body radiation. You know, the laws of black body radiation are the laws of thermodynamics extended to this new type of physical system. So Ted continues, how did classical general relativity know that the horizon area would turn out to be a form of entropy and that surface gravity is a temperature. This is the problem he has set himself to solve. 
<coughs> his answer. The Einstein field equation is born in a thermodynamic limit as a relation between thermodynamic variables, and its validity is seen to depend on the existence of local equilibrium conditions. That last qualification is extremely important and will come up in some of the, some of the problems I raised earlier, uh, later. So he's going, to resolve, he's going to resolve the puzzle by deriving the Einstein field equation from thermodynamics, not vice versa. That, I take it, is why he thinks general relativity knows why areas, entropy, surface gravity is temperature, etc. Because the Einstein field equation is in, a, is, in some sense, a thermodynamical equation of state. Just like in ordinary thermodynamics, once one, uh, one thermodynamics knows that equilibrium maximizes entropy and minimizes free energy, that entropy is the, is, um, is the Clausius formula, that temperature mediates coupling and characterizes equilibrium, and so on and so on. Because all of this arises from a, a statistical analysis of, the of an underlying microdynamics. And this is what pops out in that statistical analysis. So in the same way, there's some underlying thermodynamics. Presumably, this thermodynamics itself arises from, the mic from a statistical treatment of some mic micro degrees of freedom out pops laws of black hole mechanics. Out, out pops laws of black hole thermodynamics. Did you just move the cursor off the... Uh, oh, sorry. That's fine. So what both, pro what both programs assume in common, I'll l list those quickly before getting into the details of each, of each program, they first assume background, some background spatiotemporal structure. They need to assume a notion of a causal horizon that gives us the con that uh, assumes that uh, the, a conformal structure on, on space time. They need to assume a notion of an accelerated time like curve, in fact, uh, what is commonly called a curve of constant acceleration. There are some really interesting problems about uh, characterizing what exactly one might mean by constant acceleration not just in general relativity, but already in special relativity. That, uh, that would be an interesting talk just by itself. But I'm, I'm going to have to bracket those problems and take it that it's, it's unproblematic to take. Uh, um, if you're curious about it, you can ask me about in a Q in Q and A if you like. But I'm going to bracket that, those for the for the purposes of this talk and take it as unproblematic that we know what it means to talk about a timelike curve of constant acceleration. That gives us the affine, well, that that, pres that presupposes and in fact gives us the affine structure. So in fact, it turns out that they're both assuming the complete metric. Weil, you know, Weil's, theor Weil's theorem tells us, if we know the conformal structure, if we know the affine structure, we know the entire metric up to a constant, which presumably fix only fixes choice of units. This is all classical. We also assume um, that there are what uh, Ted calls uh, local Rindler horizons. These are, uh, these are uh, tiny little uh, space-like two surfaces uh, around, you know, you, you pick a point, you find some tiny little space-like two surface that, uh, that, that uh, is orthogonal to some, null, to some null congruence coming out of the point. And the properties of this local horizon is that they must be locally flat. They must be static, on, it must be, uh, the horizon itself is static in a certain, in a sense one can almost make precise. The horizon is just like the ordinary Rindler horizon in Minkowski space-time, generated by by almost killing fields near the horizon. These timelike curves of constant acceleration. I put almost killing field because, of course, we're not generically speaking in a space-time with any killing field. So one has to find a set of curves that very that very very close to the horizon, in some sense or other, that one can almost make precise, but is quite problematic. I'll talk about that later. Looks looks like the boost killing fields in Minkowski space time that uh, that bunch up against the uh, bunch up against the ordinary Rindler horizon in Minkowski space time. All of these together characterize the notion that the horizon is essentially in a state of both dynamical and thermodynamical equilibrium. This is all classical. Mm -hmm. No, please. <coughs> Could you say like a couple of words about the, back, uh, the, the, slide, the previous slide about the background? I mean, literally, there's a those 
specific um, conformal structure and affine structure are positive? Mm -hmm. Not just that, but there's some, but there's some particular one. Yeah, and um, so okay. if so, yeah, they, they really they really they really are they, they, they really are spe they they really are in effect that they never quite come out and say this. But if you read if you read what they actually need to make their arguments, they are specifying at least locally a complete conformal structure and a complete affine structure, and so at least locally they are they are specifying and assuming a, a complete a full metric. These are all local arguments, not global arguments. So whether or not they need to assume you know, global conformal structure, global affine structure, uh, is I think an open question. I would say they don't. Only, in, but oh, well, if they want to derive the Einstein field equation for the entire space-time, then they, have, in effect, eventually will. But insofar as these are, as formulated, all local arguments, all the structure is local. So they assume that there is a well-defined Unruh temperature associated with this associated with this local render horizon in the same way that uh, one has uh, the you know the Unruh effect giving rise to the Unruh temperature in Minkowski space-time for the ordinary Rindler horizons. That's clear, that's obviously a semi-classical effect. One, tr one, has a cla one has a quantum field um, propagating on a curved, uh, on a classical fixed background metric, fixed in the sense that the, that the, that there's no contribution of the quantum field stress energy to the classical geometry. The quantum field just propagates on this fixed, uh, on this fixed background geometry, although as we'll see, that's an, that will be a problematic assumption as well. And they assume a functional form of the entropy that is proportional to area. Remember, they can't they can't get this from the from the black hole laws because this is what exactly what they are setting out to prove uh, setting out to prove in effect. So they have they, they have to explicitly assume it. Although there there's some subtlety about that, especially in Padmanabhan's approach. But it's not clear to me, actually, whether this should be thought of as a classical or a semi-classical assumption. So I'd leave that as an open question. We can talk about that if you like later on. So Jacobson's arguments. So to set uh, to Jacobson's arguments very very closely uh, mirror what happens in ordinary thermodynamics. So I'm just going to very quickly review uh, the structure of, of a similar argument in ordinary thermo. We assume that we know entropy, the, for, the, for, the expression for entropy, as a function of energy and volume. And uh, for uh, Ted's purposes, it is important that we know it as a, as a function of energy and volume. Recall, of course, that, uh, you know, as I remarked earlier, if you know any two thermodynamical parameters, you know all the rest if you know the equation of state. So in, in principle, we could express the entropy as a function of any two other thermodynamical uh, parameters, but Ted really needs uh, the expression for entropy given uh, based on energy and volume. He, we need the Clausius relation, you know, the change in heat for systems that are very near equilibrium is temperature uh, times the differential of, ener of entropy. We need the first law in its differential form. You know, change in heat is differential energy plus um, a differential work term, pressure times change in volume. And that allows us to derive the equation of state. The pressure then, I mean, it's just a very simple calculation ba uh, based on what is, what is given here, that the equation of state is just the pressure uh, is, the pressure is temperature times the uh, partial of entropy with respect to volume. So for instance, if we're dealing with an ideal gas, you know, where PV is proportional to temperature, then uh, well, I mean, we derive, I'm sorry, we derive the ideal gas, the, the form of the equation of state for the ideal gas law from, say, simple combinatorial arguments for uh, assuming the ideal gas is a set of, of low, fairly low temperature, weakly interacting particles. Then a simple combinatorial argument, you know, a la Boltzmann, shows you that entropy should be proportional to the log of the volume plus uh, some fixed function of the energy. And then we immediately get that the equation of state PV is proportional to T. Uh, 
So that's the conceptual structure of Ted's argument. A little more specifically, so this is now actually what Ted is up to. So we assume the form of entropy, it's proportional to area. We assume a form of an expression for heat. It's a matter flux of a particular sort. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, it's actually quite important that this matter flux, the way, uh, the way Ted characterizes it, is zero if the, the space-time is vacuum. We assume the analog of the Clausius relation, given our definitions of heat and temperature, uh, of heat and entropy, with temperature given by the Unruh effect. And a, a very simple argument then shows that the Einstein field equation is, one derives the Einstein field <coughs> equation as a necessary consistency condition on the thermodynamical relations one has assumed. And Ted wants to call this an equation of state. I think because the formal derivation mirrors the derivation of equations of state in the earlier, you know, in the previous slide about in what happens in ordinary thermodynamics. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact right now that in ordinary thermodynamics, the, the equation of state is not a consistency condition on the thermodynamical relation. So the, the, there's already a slight conceptual mismatch but which may or may not be relevant, not clear yet. The matter flux is the null component of the stress energy, energy tensor tangent to the horizon. It's the killing energy of the matter field. Uh, uh, as measured along the null geodesics that generate the Rindler horizon. So it's so as killing energy, it's conserved along the horizon. That characterizes the idea that the horizon is in fact, essentially in a state of thermodynamical equilibrium the change in entropy instantaneously is zero, as should be, since the horizon is, in some sense, static. So the structure of Padmanavan's argument, I'm really blasting through this, this is great. So, assume the form, assume a, a definite form, functional form for the entropy, again, it's proportional to area of the, of the horizon. Assume the form, assume an expression for heat. This will. This is where. This is one of the two main differences uh, that uh, in Padmanavan's approach with Ted's approach. The it's again. It's a matter flux of a particular sort, but we can already see a, um, a profound difference here. It doesn't necessarily equal zero in, in vacuum space time. In effect, Padmanavan is um, is assuming something like um, the Meissner sharp energy, I mean, strictly speaking, that's well defined only in, in, in space-time's spherical symmetry, but it's a slight generalization of the Meissner sharp quasi-local energy. And so you pick up terms that are proportional to the intrinsic scalar curvature in, 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 in the, in the two-dimensional hori two dimensional horizon itself. That in particular means that unlike in uh, Ted's uh, I like in, uh, in Ted's uh, characterization of heat flux, which depends only on components of the Ricci tensor, you actually end up necessarily, you, you necessarily pick up components of the Riemann tensor here. So that suggests that uh, conform, not just Ricci uh, curvature, but conformal curvature is going into the characterization of quasi-local energy. So, you know, maybe that set Maybe that gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling because you think, ah, conformal curvature, that's, you know, that, those are gravitational degrees of freedom. Maybe we're really kind of incorporated a, uh, some, some aspect or some idea of gravitational energy here. Sounds groovy. We'll see. We also have to assume a particular form of work because what, you know, Padmanavan's goal is to show uh, equivalence of the Einstein field equation with the first law, and the first law always includes a work term. And Padmanavan assumes that this, that the work, that the effective work term is a force integral of a particular sort um, that's associated with the matter of flux. And, and he wants to call it a, a work term and a force integral because it is effectively a pressure times, a, an integral of a pressure times a change in volume. 
And um, I, I'm going through this very schematically, not very precisely and rigorously, because at the level of analysis I'm worried about, I don't, I don't, a lot of the very fine technical details, I think, are not relevant and would just obfuscate and distract from, from the heart of the conceptual issues. But I will talk a little, I will talk a little more later on in the technical part, in, when I'm running through some technical problems about why, how and why one should think of this term uh, that uh, Padmanabhan wants to interpret as pressure, why we, should why we should or should not think of it as a pressure, and why we should or should not think of this, of this uh, differential term as a, as a change in volume. With these assumptions, again, it's a fairly straightforward <coughs> argument to show that the, it turns out the Einstein field equation pops out as identical to the, to the first law. And again, Padmanabhan wants to say, equation, wants to call this an equation of state. But again, one should keep in mind that an equation of state in ordinary thermodynamics is not equivalent to the first law. And so again, there's already a, perhaps a slight conceptual mis mismatch between ordinary thermo and what's going on here. I, I want to emphasize from the start, just because I'm pointing out some mismatches, some prima facie, mis prima facie mismatches, between ordinary thermodynamics and what's going on here, that's, that, that does not automatically mean that these, that these mismatches are problems. In fact, it's exactly these kinds of mismatches that may give us some insight into how gravitational thermodynamics differs from ordinary thermodynamics, which may give us some insight into what, what, the underli what an underlying st uh, st statistical mechanics of microdegrees of freedom might have to look like in order to give rise to gravitational thermodynamics. Presumably, differences at, the le differences at the thermodynamic level will enforce differences at the, at the statistical level. That might serve to you know, give us some constraints on what the underlying gravitational statistical mechanics should look like. Perhaps that will serve as constraints on possible in, uh, you know, in uh, guiding research and looking for theories of quantum gravity. All incredibly speculative, but I'm just pointing out that these mismatches aren't necessarily demerits. They might, in fact, be virtues. I'm remaining uh, non-committal at the moment on that. So in this case, the matter flux is the null component of the stress energy tensor transverse to the horizon. Um, thus, the work term absent in, J in Jacobson's derivation, because there's an effective pressure, so Padmanabhan wants to say, pushing stuff through the horizon. And pushing stuff through the horizon is presumably going to instantaneously you know, uh, uh, eventuate in slight changes in, the vo in a natural volume that one wants to associate, or Padmanabhan thinks is a natural volume and wants to associate with the horizon. And because, in fact, we're dealing with null components that are transverse to the horizon, not just tangent, this is not... Uh, I should actually have included this as a bullet point. Uh, that we don't just get the null null component, as in uh, Jacobson's derivation. We actually get uh, all. We actually get all, all the all the null components. No, null space. Null space like null and all three space like. So null x one, null x two, null x three, and you know since it's symmetric, we automatically get the x one, null x two, null x three, null. So we get a little more here. And I already remarked on the fact that this necessarily includes terms uh, proportional to Riemann tensor components. And so maybe we're picking up something like a gravitational energy, which would be cool if one can make that precise. Now, if one works through the details upon Monobarn's arguments in, uh, somewhat carefully and really uh, dwells on what exactly it is he's shown, in a sense, I think it, that his derivation, his results, shouldn't be terribly surprising. It turns out it's really just a special case of a strength and form of, Lo of Lovelock's theorem in disguise, that the Einstein tensor is the only symmetric, covariantly divergence-free concomitant of the Riemann tensor that has units of stress energy. If that made no sense to you, uh, ask me about it in Q&A, and I can describe it more fully if you like. So we now have on the table we now have on the table two proposals, two arguments 
that start from what really look and smell like thermodynamical assumptions and that end up deriving in different ways something like the necessity of the Einstein field equation, which the idea is then to interpret as an effective thermodynamical equation of state for you know, over the thermodynamical quantities one has assumed in formulating the expressions and relations that make up the de that uh, enter into the derivation and presumably arise from an underlying statistical treatment of micro degrees of freedom which we don't really yet know what they may be. However, there are a lot of technical problems with these arguments. First of all, they assume that every point in a, in a space-time, you just give me any old random space-time, give me as crazy as you like, they assume that every point, you can always choose a small enough neighborhood around the point that one, that, uh, such that one can, uh, there will always exist in that very small neighborhood around the given point, a local Rindler horizon, in a sense I characterized earlier. There is no rigorous argument to this effect that, that such structures exist. People, uh, both Ted and Padmanabhan and others who have worked on the program, when they justify the existence, they say, they may sketch a few hur uh, heuristic calculations. Well, they generally do sketch a few heuristic ca uh, calculations, but they always end up, in the end, invoking the principle of equivalence to justify the assumption that these local or inner horizons always exist. And of course, I mean, one really shouldn't endow the equivalence principle with the honorific of the definite article and capitalization because it's there's not there's no such thing as the equivalence principle you know everyone and their mother has their own version of the equivalence principle there are easily like 50 different variations and different formulations you can find in the literature and find argue about and but for our purposes we can very crudely think of the equivalence what is meant by the equivalence principle here as the idea that locally space-time looks like Minkowski space-time. That, however, basing, uh, arguing for the existence of local Rindler horizons on this rough formulation of the equivalence principle, however, I think is a really crappy argument. Because in the required form, the equivalence principle is either false or just irrelevant. One can't transform away the Riemann metric, I mean the Riemann tensor, so if the Riemann tensor is non-zero, I don't care how close you get to the point, there's always curvature in a generic space-time. If you want to derive non-trivial relations involving the Ricci tensor, which they both must do, you can't ignore the Riemann tensor. Therefore, you, you know, it's there. Can't, you know, can't, can't get away from it. If you want to have non-trivial stress-energy flux, which both require then generically, the space-time is not going to be static around, you know, anywhere locally around these points. And furthermore, the characterization of the local Rindler horizons completely ignores shear and twist in um, uh, that um, the, the, the intrinsic shear and twist of, prime, of both the conformal and the, and the Ricci curvature. And especially for Padmanavan, the shear generally arises from uh, from conformal structure, and he, you know, he, it's an integral part of his matter flux characterization that it includes conformal structure. So ignoring, sh it's not clear how, how seriously one should take, or it's not clear how good an approximation it is, because that's what it must be an approximation to treat matter flux as shear free, when you know there can be extraordinary amount of, generically speaking, there can be an extraordinary um, extraordinary amount of shear. In, in, the, in the neighborhood of any. So is the concern here, I mean, not a general one about local Rindler horizons, but a one for somebody who's trying to derive general relativity, they don't have the right to postulate these ahead of time as part of the derivation? That's exactly right, yes. So, okay. so the, I, I think that, there, I'm not saying that it, in the end, this is a, I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad assumption. I'm saying there are a lot of issues 
given that there is no given that there is no rigorous result showing the existence <coughs> of such horizons, not even under a restricted set of conditions, and given these prima facie problems with characterizing horizons in generic space times in showing in showing in specific cases by explicit calculation that this kind of horizon structure exists at any point in generic space time I think that they really owe us a more rigorous clear argument with a clear statement of what the of what the assumptions are that allows us to unproblematically assume that there are these local Rindler horizons there for them to make use of now I will say, um, I guess I'll, 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 I'll put, you know, I was about to say, um, suggest a possible way that they can deal with this, but I think I'm actually going to get to that slide in a few minutes. So I'll put that aside for a moment. So this is about the 10 minute warning. Okay. So there's a problem for um, whether the temperature is really well defined. All the, te the temperature is supposed to be derived from the Unero effect. The unary temperature, however, is defined, strictly speaking, for the unique uh, KMS state of the quantum field that's invariant under the action of, of the isometries that generate the horizon, these boosts. And that is the relevant vacuum state. One has the unary temperature only for, the, only for this unique KMS state, and it's always a vacuum state. But both derivations assume non-trivial matter flux. We, we are not, we're, we're, we're not in a vacuum. And we can't assume it's test matter that doesn't contribute you know, to, to, the, uh, to the background curvature, because otherwise we, would, otherwise we wouldn't get a non-trivial relation between the Einstein tensor and the, and, the, and the matter, which is what we want. We'd only have you know, reach equals zero, which we don't want. So here are the possible responses. So both, uh, uh, here's a possible response that, um, I, that, I, that I've come up with that tries to take account, that, uh, tries to address both of these problems more or less simultaneously. And uh, I actually uh, emailed, when I, after I formulated this argument, I emailed Ted and asked him what he thought about it. And he said it actually, thought, he, he said it actually sounded pretty good and that in fact that's generally the way he himself thinks about it. So I, 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 was, I was very encouraged. But he also admitted that he has a absolutely no idea how to make these ideas, how to make these arguments more precise. So this is only a very initial programmatic vague set of hand-waving ideas about how one might respond to these. One assumes that matter is weak enough and static enough, whatever exactly that means, that the local state is close enough to vacuum that the deviations from thermality are negligible. So is there a way to make this precise while accounting for the nonlinearity of the Einstein field equation? Here's a first stab. The horizon entropy is huge. I mean, it's just enormous compared to the entropy of any ordinary matter. And one might think of it, and, uh, this, and the way that uh, Ted in particular, and sometimes Padmanavan seems to think of it, is that it's the entanglement of the, of the UV degrees of freedom of, um, uh, of the correlations of the vacuum fluctuations on, the, on either side of the horizon. So you view this as a thermal, entr uh, thermal entropy. So you take the integral of, the te of, this, of temperature cubed, where temperature is measured locally by these almost static observers. It diverges as one over the redshift factor as you, as you approach the horizon. And the excitation of the state corresponding to the stress energy flux is purely an infrared phenomenon, negligible with regard to entropy and temperature and with regard to deviations from equilibrium. And therefore, one can conclude that to a system outside the horizon, which is what we're interested in, these, these, acceler you know, these accelerated observers, the excitations, these, these vacuum excitations, any excitation, in fact, any perturbation of, in the matter field that is propagating towards the horizon, enters the thermal bath of this approximately UNRU radiation at, at, at the horizon and is thermalized because the, because the, ent the entropy of the field is, is completely dominates and overwhelms the entropy of these perturbations in the matter field. Incredibly vague. How might one characterize the fact that we're, I mean, how, how might one deal with the fact that we're away from equilibrium? Two possibilities. You might calculate non-equilibrium non co uh, corrections, like the standard high order transport terms and non-equilibrium thermodynamics required for consistency with the Einstein field equation. You might then con you might constrain the, or you might constrain the non-equilibrium cor corrections based on their physical principles, maybe the maybe the generalized second law, and treat them as in fact observable deviations from the Einstein field equation, which might actually give you one might hope a grip on how to make observations and experimentally test all this stuff. 
And either way, one might think one is getting one is possibly getting a clue, as I say, to, the, to an underlying statistical theory, and there possibly, therefore, to what a theory of quantum gravity should look like or must look like in order to give rise to such a statistical accounting that gives rise to these to, to the uh, to these the uh, thermodynamical uh, non-equilibrium terms. It's important to note, though, very simple, albeit back of the envelope calculations, show that these deviations would be utterly minuscule in any non-extreme FLRW cosmological model, which might exp which might explain why the deviations, if they are there, have not yet been observed. The deviations from you know the Einstein field equation. So to conclude, I think I have what, seven minutes. Yeah. So I think I'll actually make it right on time. I'm going to run through some conceptual issues. So I, I want to say first of all, I think it'd be, I think it would be a, a really fascinating project to work to work in some detail through the differences between these two programs and see why, given these very very important and deep both physical and conceptual differences in their assumptions and, and the argument of structure and even the, the structure of their conclusion, why in some sense or other they both still seem to work, it, you know, putting aside all the technical, if, you know, assuming one can deal with all the technical issues. But I'm not focusing on that. This is not the project I'm engaged in here. I'm rather focusing on the similarities um, of, that the pro of the projects and, the and, the and their shared problems and issues. Although I will, in fact, now start with by focusing on a problem that only Jacobson has, and then on one that only Padmanabhan has. But then I really will talk about the, the shared stuff. So Jacobson's uh, conception of matter flux is heat flow. Well, the pro here is that we really we really are care only about stress energy flux. You know what couples the curve only stress energy couples the curvature. Nothing idiosyncratic about the particular kind of matter field at issue determines curvature at all. So that is exactly like heat in thermodynamics. Heat doesn't care about any idiosyncrasy of the underlying stuff that has the heat. So that, so again, this seems like a pro. This seems like you know we really are, that there is something really thermodynamical about this assumption. The con is that energy, especially gravitational energy, is really ill-defined in general relativity. And it's not clear to me why killing energy in particular and a special form of the quasi-local uh, energy, the first law, should be relevant in particular, why we, why, we, why we should single them out as being of particular significance and having a particularly deep and intimate relation with the Einstein field equation, and even more why the relation between the killing energy and the quasi-local energy of the first law should be relevant. There are lots of other ways one might try to characterize something like energy in general relativity. Uh, one might, for instance, think of geodesic deviation as an effective work term. Completely different from either one of these conceptions of energy. Why are these conceptions of energy privileged, not the one I just mentioned? No idea. The main, uh, one, the main uh, problem that Padmanavan has, that I think predict, that is peculiar to Padmanavan's approach, is that gravitational force, which is what he needs to, to define his work term, is simply not an unambiguous idea in general relativity. In fact, I, I personally would, would go so far as to say that it's not a well-posed or coherent concept at all. You, you just don't have it. A lot of, but some people will think it's going too far. But a, a gravitational force is not un unambiguously defined, especially for accelerated matter. I mean, one can try to argue that gravity is an attractive force for geodesics and you know, incongruences from the Ray Chaudhuri equation, but even that's already a but even that's already problematic. Because for one thing, just because, just because using the Ray equation, you can show that the that the um, you know expansion is negative, so you know GDs tend to accelerate tend to accelerate towards each other, and you say ah, there's a for gravity you know gravity is an attractive force. Well, just because the, the, if you have a congru if you have a GDs congruence and the expansion is negative, that doesn't actually mean that every single ge every single ge all the GDs in the congruence are actually accelerating towards each other. The expansion can still be in total negative, while there are non-trivial patches where the uh, geodesics are actually accelerating away from each other. And you can't even apply the Ray equation for to accelerated curves, so you can't even use that argument. Inter the interp interpreting the term multiplying dV in Padmanabhan's work integral as pressure 
Well, that works only for particular forms of stress energy. Um, the f stress energy of Hawking-Ellis type 1, which essentially are stress energy tensors where one can find a Riemann normal coordinate system that diagonalizes the matrix form of the tensor. Not all matter fields of interest are of that type. It's simply not clear how to interpret the term that Padmanavan wants to interpret as pressure if we're dealing with Hawking-Ellis of stress energy tensors of Hawking-Ellis type other than one. And it's not clear to me why volume is relevant at all, what one even means by spatial physical volume here. If you just think about uh, trying to try, uh, all, all the well-known problems involved in trying to define the, the volume of the interior of a black hole, I mean, you, you can slap an entire FLRW space-time inside a Schwarzschild black hole, perfectly consistent. Even if you take, in some sense, if you try and do some principal calculations with, with some with say some simple collapsing matter, you have some scalar field and it's collapsing and forms the event horizon and you try and use the initial value formulation problem to evolve forward. So uh, you know, quite generically, you can show that as the scalar field approaches what we would naively think of as the singularity, the transverse spatial volume grows divergently. It, grow, it grows without bound. The, in, even in that case, the interior volume, of, uh, interior volume of the black hole is not a well-defined concept. It's also just not clear to me why volume is relevant here at all in try, in, cal, in for characterizing a gravitational work term. When in thermodynamics, you know the the definition of entropy is defined by heat exchange. Heat exchange is defined by total energy minus work. So if we really want to be talking about, uh, end up talking about something like a thermodynamical entropy or assuming something like a thermodynamical entropy, and we know that entropy is supposed to be proportional to area, it's not clear what this volume term is doing here. There's a problem, I think, with trying to derive a classical field equation from a semi-classical premise. Now you might want to say, hold, you know, wait a minute, hold your horses. That's completely non-problematic. We, you know, we want to do that all the time. We want to show that Quantum mechanics gives rise to classical behavior. Can't be, can't be a problem. I actually think, though, that there is a particular problem here. Because in the regime where Unruh temperature is physically significant, we don't expect the classical Einstein field equation to hold for non-quantum matter. And in the regime where the Einstein field equation holds for non-quantum matter, how can, the, how can the Unruh temperature possibly be physically significant? It's going to be, you know, when there's ordinary matter fields around, you know, you can at most going to get lunar temperatures of like 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. And it'd be completely swamped by the thermodynamical properties of the ordinary matter, which in general will have a temperature that is not 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. Then there's the issue of the fact that if the game really is trying to show that one can assume some background thermodynamical uh, relations, derive the Einstein field equation, and therefore explain the laws of black hole thermodynamics. Well, there is a very deep difference between the laws of black hole thermodynamics and the ordinary thermodynamical laws. The laws of black hole mechanics are theorems of differential geometry. They are math, well, except for the third law, they are mathematically rigorous mathematical theorems. The Einstein field equation actually plays no role in their derivation or proof whatsoever in the mathematical derivation, the Einstein field equation just comes in at the very end to provide a physical interpretation to the curvature terms that one uses in the proof. Ordinary thermodynamical laws, however, are, are just empirical generalizations, albeit profoundly entrenched. They're theoretically justified, perhaps, by the statistical, by the statistical mechanics of the underlying microdegrees of freedom, and with perhaps some stipulations about likelihood of initial states based on dynamical arguments. You guys know the story. There are extremely complex evidential relations between the statistical mechanics and the, the and the thermodynamics that's supposed to emerge from it. It's not well, that's why I put justify in quotes because I think the evidential relations between statmec and thermo is much much more complex than philosophers tend to uh, recognize or uh, uh, include in their analyses of these reduction and emergence arguments. That's a very interesting topic by itself, but no time to go into it. And again, you presumably the thermodynamics, its underlying gravitation, it arises itself from this underlying statistical mechanics of these micro degrees of freedom, same as ordinary thermodynamics. But if that's the case, how can they possibly give rise to theorems of differential geometry? 
Then there's a, an interpretive issue that I think is quite interesting. We have the idea that we're either deriving a non-thermodynamical relation from thermodynamics and interpreting it as thermodynamical, or else we're deriving a thermodynamical relation sim you know, full stop from thermodynamics. You know, wh which of these two and why? And in part, that depends on what one assumes in the argument. And by assume, I don't just mean formal relation I, and you know, fixed principles. I mean how you interpret the quantities in the start, whether you just assume you know, ab initio that these really are thermodynamical quantities, or whether you want to try and give some further argument that what you're, that what you're using are thermodynamical quantities. And also, it depends on what one actually derives, you know, consistency, consistency condition versus equivalence to first law, and how one justifies the interpretation of what one actually derives. And in all of these, in all these interpretive moves, it ha I think to really, just, to really say that what one is doing is, in, is somehow or other deriving something thermodynamical, whether it's a purely, inter whether in the end that means you're just doing something purely interpretive, or whether in the end you mean that really is getting something at, you know, deep about the world, your justification for that has to be more than simply formally identifying analogous quantities in, for, you know, in formally identical relations. But that is what's most often done in these arguments. What are the physical assumptions, physical significance of these assumptions? Well, the, Cal the Clausius relation, I mean, it kind of, I mean, the Clausius relation kind of looks vacuous. It really is just the definition of entropy. Is there anything really physically substantive there? The first law ha it has a kind of vacuity in the same sense. Heat is almost always defined as all, just all the energy not accounted for by work, you know, given the total energy. Eddington has a really lovely remark in his, ma in his mathematical theory of relativity. He says, the mathematicians have now defined energy to be that quantity which is conserved uh, you know, with respect to, uh, a little anachronistically speaking, a time translation symmetry. That approach has turned out to be unfortunate in the light of recent developments. And by recent developments, he means GR, because you can't do that in GR. So, what, so then, what is the physical significance of the Einstein field equation in, as a result of these derivations? Consistency, a consistency condition is not, a st is not an equation of state. I don't know what status is doing there. It's not an equation of state, as in, it doesn't have the same, oh, maybe it doesn't have the same status, I'm trying to say, as equation of state in ordinary thermodynamics. Neither does the first law. So are we really getting at something physically substantive with this derivation, or are we just making some interpretive moves, giving some new conceits based on identities for, for old geometrical quantities? What is the limits of propriety for, the, for this derivation? What regime does it really hold good in? Well, clearly something like near equilibrium, same as ordinary thermodynamics. But then what about wildly non-static space-time regions? For instance, you know, active galactic, active galactic nuclei, like at, in, around Sagittarius A, at the center of the Milky Way. These are very far from equilibrium by any standard, you know, by, any, you know, by any stretch of the term. I suspect it's gonna be very hard to find anything remotely resembling a local Rindler horizon you know, in the middle of the, in the middle of the accretion disk, with you know t ten, 10 to the 15 you know electron volts of of power being you know sh shot out in in, in blasts of, ma of, ma of magnetic flux and and and, and uh, cosmic rays, you know just, you know with, with wild with wild fluctuations in power output, you know, that's just not going to happen. So we and we do, but we do have some good astronomical evidence that the Einstein field equation is 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 well obe is obeyed to a high level of accuracy in say the middle of an active galactic nuclei. One lesson that I that I think both Ted and, Pad and Padmanabhan want to draw from their analysis of correct is that it, it is that it's a category mistake to quantize the Einstein field equation. It would be like they say quantizing the ideal gas law. That's just got to be wrong, right? Well, I mean, I, I mean, that's, that sounds cool. Yeah, you, you never want to quantize the ideal gas law. You never want to quantize the Navier-Stokes equations. But in fact, sometimes we do. Yeah. Phonons. So it's not clear when they say it'd be a category mistake to quantize, you know, uh, you know, phenomenological equations of state. One shouldn't just swallow swallow that unthinkingly, but perhaps one might want to think a little bit more closely about it. So in sum, last slide, conclusion, where, where does all this leave us? I think that, both, that these programs are extraordinarily interesting, 
they are both just very enticingly suggestive of something. They seem to get at something very deep, but I don't really know what that is. Thank you. So may I ask a question then? So just, um, Eric, thanks a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, um, do you know this paper of Kutabala, um, who claims that uh, Jacob's notion of, uh, of, of Metaflux is basically a special case of, uh, of that of, of Padmanabha? And if yes, uh, what do you make of that? I don't think I know this paper. Um, when, when did, what, what's, the, what's the author's name again? But the author, Kutabala, okay. it's basically the idea that uh, rather than looking directly at the flux uh, at the horizon, you first uh, set up a kind of observer system close to the horizon, and then you come closer and closer to the horizon, and the flux you get there basically is different from that what uh, Jacobson claims. But however, if you uh, do some approximations, you can obtain what uh, Jacobson does. So in this kind of picture, you can then claim that uh, yeah, Jacobson's derivation is just a very special case of Padmanabha's. Okay. So I can say yep. Uh, pl please send me the paper, but um, uh, ju just based on what you said, I have a couple things to say, and you can tell me what, uh, what, what whether it's on point for this guy's arguments. So one of the main differences, well, the main difference in how uh, Ted and Padmanabha define flux is that if you think of the of these of these Rindler observers, you know the, 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 these boosted time like curves getting closer and closer to the horizon, then they're essentially you know you pick, fix the horizon, pick a you know, pick a Rindler, Rindler observer really you know the approach is really close to the horizon, pick a point on it, and at that point there are going to be in a natural sense ingoing and outgoing. Null, ray, uh, null rays. The ingoing are the ones that are going to be transverse. That as you as they propagate, will run transverse to the horizon. The outgoing will be the ones that, that in the limit, as these as these accelerated time like curves approach the horizon, will become tangent to the horizon. And so, Padmanavan uses the ingoing null geodesics to uh, to to define the matter flux. Ted uses the outgoing null geodesics to define the matter flux. And there is a sense in which there's a physical equivalence between the ingoing and the outgoing uh, congruences. But, and so I can maybe kind of see how an argument would go that matter flux, that, that one can transform in a way that shows approximate equivalence between matter flux as defined by each of them. But there's still, but there's a serious issue in that For because Ted's because the way, because Ted is using the, the ingoing flux, he's forced to he's forced to um, ignore shear because locally these these flat null horizons have no shear. But Padmanabhan is not forced to ignore shear because these ingoing guys can exhibit shear as they pass through. So that that's not the only difference between them. But insofar as one is already ignoring, and so far as they both ignore shear anyway. Maybe that's the, maybe that's just the kind of assumption one has to make in order to argue that there that the definition of matter flux based on what on either the ingoing or the outgoing null geodesics are equivalent. Is that the kind of thing that he's doing? Um, actually, so I go looked at it. I don't remember so well, but just it was something I had on my mind. But I can send you the reference later and perhaps um, okay. sort it out. Yeah, yeah but please um, do. But I, I mean, I, as I say, I I, I can I can yeah. see vaguely an ar an argument to this effect. But it's only off the top of my head. I haven't thought deeply about it, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be approximative. But uh, yeah, I'd like to see the details. Okay, cool. Uh, question team. Yeah. So we have I have one of the minutes on the screen. Hello, Eric. Do you hear me? Yes, uh, who, whom, whom, whom am I speaking with? Valeria Chasova. I think we met in Paris. Oh, uh, yes, I remember. Okay, uh, I have a naive question. Could you tell what is the uh, relationship between this derivation 
and uh, the derivation of uh, uh, Ashley's equations, well, of general relativity from classical uh, um, or special relativity and so on. So you're asking about, um, th there's, a, there's a well known family of arguments that argue that, uh, so I don't know any from special relativity, but I know uh, some from Newtonian gravity. Is that, is yes, that? Yes, at least that. Okay. okay. So the, uh, the most precise forms of those arguments I know run as follows. Well, one starts, one doesn't have to do it this way, but it's, e but it's easiest to make the argument precise by starting with geometrized Newtonian gravity with, with Newton Cartan. It turns out then that the Ricci tensor is the Ricci tensor is equal essentially to uh, second derivatives of the gravitational potential times the temporal metric. So in vacuum, Ricci is zero, or you know, in, for constant gravitational fields, Ricci is zero. For linear, for even for uh, gravitational fields that give rise to linear acceleration, Ricci is zero. And so one thinks, how do we generalize? The natural generalization is vacuum Einstein equation should be Ricci equals zero, and that gets one to the to the vacuum equation. And then one says, but you know, Ricci is not divergence free. So if I want to, if, if in analogy with, with Newton, I want to stick some matter term on the right hand side, you know, that the matter is what's going to be generating the, the, the space time curvature. So what is the simplest geometric, geometric object that is linear in Ricci and is divergence free? Ah, uh, Einstein tensor. That's my field equation. So. I've, I've never thought, it's, it's an interesting question, I've never thought about uh, what the relations between the, those two family, what those two kinds of derivations are. Off the top of my head, they seem radically different. One is, I mean, in some, in some just to speak very crudely, in the, Newton, in the Newton to GR derivation, one is going kind of top down, and in the you know, uh, jacobson padmanabhan derivations, one is going bottom up. One is, uh, you know, one in Newton to, Newton to GR, one is one is saying I have this effective theory that I know isn't the, isn't isn't the right theory because of you know Mercury and and other issues. But it clear, but it's so damn good. It's got to give me some clue to what the right theory should be, especially in the weak field regime. So I'm going to use it as um, you know to to find a simp the simplest possible field equation that reduces to Newton and captures the Kind of structure and spirit of Newton, you know, some curvature equals uh, some uh, some function of matter, and you know, voila, out, out pops out, out pops Einstein field equation. Uh, but in, in the in the Padmanabhan Jacobson case, you are saying, well, I think that there's actually some deeper theory. You know, GR GR we know is only effective theory; it can't be right. And the evidence, although the evidence in this case is actually much 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 worse than the evidence in, in for arguing that Newton can't be right. There's Essentially, no experimental evidence we have at all that GR is wrong, but they're all theoretical arguments, which, you know, depending on your predilections, you, I think, will I take very seriously or not take very seriously. But in any event, it's ba the, you know, the Padmanabhan Jacobson derivations are based on the assumption that general relativity is only effective, is not, is not the deepest theory of space time structure, space time geometry, and its relation to matter, ordinary matter. So we're going to make the most minimal assumptions we can about what an underlying theory should look like in a, a purely phenomenological way, so to speak, and try and, and then see what field equation pops out by assuming that the underlying, that the deeper underlying theory is essentially thermodynamical in character as suggested by black hole physics. So at least in that, at least in that sense, they seem to me to be radically different. They have can, the assumptions they make are of a radically different sort, and the structure of the arguments they make are of a radically different sort. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, we have to take turns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure I have a question, really. It's more of a remark. Uh, That's cool. So, thank you very much for your talk, and I think what you have here on your last slide, 
uh, is exactly right. Uh, what is it that is suggested or is sort of follows from all of these, uh, all of this work? And what's often suggested is that this will give us a key to quantum gravity and we'll learn something about quantum gravity or something like that. Um, but, but here's one reason, at least, uh, to think that maybe that's not quite right. And the reason is that, as I think you've shown beautifully, what we recover from those thermodynamic assumptions is not really full GR. It's something that, under specific circumstances, in certain approximations, in certain regimes, looks like GR, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the full theory because, uh, you know, as, you, as you've shown, many of these assumptions are not generally true. And uh, that would then not be a problem for a more fundamental theory in case uh, those parts which we cannot recover from GR are those parts which would be no loss if we couldn't recover them from a more fundamental theory. But that doesn't seem to be right either. For instance, you've shown that the case of the active galactic nuclei and things like that, where we, you know, GR seems to be a, a reasonably good theory, at least approximately true, uh, we, we don't seem to be able to get here. So if, if the connection is somehow more limited, how is it then, why should we think that we learn something about the more fundamental theory? I, no, I, I, complete, I completely agree with you. The, I mean, I, I, I think though that there are, I think though that there are two ways of, that there are two, at least two ways of looking at the, at, at the point, at the points you're making. If you want, if you're really sympathetic to these programs, you're going to want to say, well, look, even an active galactic, even an active galactic nuclei, yeah, the power output's enormous. We might think that, you know, it's, we're not going to, we're going to have a really difficult time uh, defining Unruh temperature because there's obviously no KMS state. There's nothing like a KMS state there. Uh, it's, you know, things are wildly non-static. It's not clear that we're going to really get something that looks enough like local Rindler horizons. So we expect to get deviations from the Einstein field equation, but now the, the, my pious hope is that when I actually do the extremely hard calculations of trying to show what these deviations will be, uh, they'll be small enough that our evidence, which is, which is good by, you know, by astronomical astrophysical standards, that EFE is, you know, holds to quite good approximation in, the, in, in these AGNs, well, the, the deviations will be small enough that they will still fit well within the error bars of these astrophysical observations. I think perhaps um, a more problematic case for them is, I mean, it's sometimes shocking, I think, for people to learn, it was certainly shocking for me to learn when I first learned this, that on standard cosmological models, when we're, t when we're talking about very, very early state universe and doing things like uh, uh, accounting for baryon production and you know, helium to hydrogen to lithium ratios by, 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 by baryogenesis you know, starting in the incredibly early universe, we, we actually used classical GR all the way back to about 10 to the minus 15 seconds after the Big Bang. That is really, really close. I mean, that's, that's really far back. And matter is incredibly hot and dense. I mean, it's mind-blowingly hot and dense there. So surely, if anywhere, there are on this approach, there's going to be some really massive deviations to Einstein field equation, but we use classical GR with extraordinary accuracy to predict things like you know, hydrogen to helium to lithium ratios from baryogenesis. So again, is that problematic? Well, again, I, I can imagine someone saying, someone defending this program saying, look, yeah, of course there are going to be deviations, but in this case, because of uh, you know maybe inflation or maybe spreading out and cooling, all of those devi all of those deviations from essentially equilibrium just get entirely washed out by the time we hit you know three hundred thousand years after Big Bang, where we which is right now essentially the limit of our observational acuity. Although actually just a couple of days ago, uh, this group in Cambridge I think published a really interesting paper in which they claim to push the envelope of um, electromagnetic astronomy earlier than 300,000 years based on some really interesting statistical techniques, but that's jury's still out on whether they've actually done that. And even if they have, it's they're only pushing it back like 200,000 years, so, you know, 
still quite far from 10 to the minus 15 seconds after the Big Bang. So I, I think that's what I, I mean, I think that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm really just expanding on your remarks. I agree with you. Uh, okay, thank you. So Niels had another question, but maybe we'll do some questions from here before Niels gets his second bite of the cherry. Tom, you want to? Um, sure, yeah, I just had um, a question about whether we're really meant to think of these as somehow um, getting at something um, more fundamental that's, you know, giving us an alternative derivation of the Einstein field equations, and maybe this is more just you know, another way of exploring an analogy between ordinary thermodynamics and black hole thermodynamics. I mean, if you just think of two less exotic systems, if you're exploring an analogy between, like, mechanical resonance and resonance and electrical circuits, you're going to be able to show that there are various kind of functional forms um, that, you know, mass plays a role in and uh, conductance and so on. Um, I mean, uh, inductance is not the word. Things. But I mean, that is not showing you that there's some sort of important um, sort of common foundation. It's just um, deepening the analogy. So uh, is the idea, well, you know, everything's a simple harmonic oscillator, you know, but that doesn't mean that pendulums are really vibrating strings or really, you know, trap, trap quantum particles or really photons or, you know, and so on. But we can learn about some of these systems by studying the formal properties of others, but we shouldn't take any analogy beyond that more seriously, or? Yeah, and the thought is, rather than this providing an alternative derivation of, um, of general relativity, it's just a way of showing that the analogy is perhaps deeper than one might think of the surface level. So, okay, so I, 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 I now see. So, this, so the suggestion is, it, let, let me try to let me try to restate it to, just to make sure that, uh, that that I understand you. So we're not actually assuming anything at a so to speak deeper theoretical level for the Einstein field equation. Everything we're assuming is more or less at the same level of same phenomenological level, the same level of theoretical treatment. Not anything that necessarily assumes or is based on or grounded on or underlies classical GR. Mm. We. Based on these assumptions, we then show that Einstein field equation follows in some sense or other from these assumptions. The, the assumptions really look thermodynamical. There are some arguments that one can make that these geometrical quantities that are related in these ways really have a have really have a you know, deeper thermodynamical character than just the formal analogy uh, formal analogy would suggest. Therefore, we should think of the, what these are doing is not deriving Einstein field equation from deeper theory, but rather buttressing the idea that gravitation really has a a, a deeply thermodynamical character from the get-go. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Um, I, so I think I think that's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting way to uh, to approach these derivations. Um, I haven't thought about it, and I guess the main reason I haven't thought about it is because that's not how these guys present it. Mm. But that just shows that I haven't thought independently enough about these problems. If I because that that's a really nice that's a really nice I think alternative approach to thinking about them. Um, One of the problems with that approach is that what one gains in deepening the analogy and trying to show that gravitation in general is more is more is more uh, has a more essential thermodynamical character than one might have thought at first is that that's that that consequence is going to follow only insofar as one has good independent arguments that the that the assumptions you're making the relations you're Assuming in the first place of themselves, it really thermodynamical, and there is some. A, a lot of these arguments have, have have a fairly circular flavor. They, the assumptions they make, their arguments that they that, that we're latching onto something thermodynamical, always in the end, not always, but very often in the end, seems to devolve upon the idea that black hole thermodynamic, that black hole mechanics is thermodynamical, or. You know, uh, or on the idea that well, en that mass is just energy, and volume is just volume, and these are thermodynamical parameters. So if I can define, you know, if I can characterize entropy in use uh, as a function of, en of energy and volume, then that's got to be thermodynamical. 
I mean, so I get, so yeah, I, I, I think your suggestion is a really nice one and, de and definitely is worth thinking about more. But it runs in, yeah, but the, the, obvious, the obvious issue, I think, with trying to justify that as the right way of thinking about it is, is how well one can get thermodynamical property, the characteristics of these relations off the ground in the first place. Um, uh, thanks. thanks very much for the talk, Eric. It was fascinating, as always. Um, it's, this is sort of, I think, very closely related to the, to the kind of thing that, that Tom was asking about. But in the context of some of the things that you've said and written about uh, with respect to sort of kinematics versus dynamics um, across various, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, f formally dynamically analogous systems, why would you, in, that, in, in light of that, think that the derivation of a dynamical equation should tell you anything about whether uh, the two systems are sort of getting, you know, based on the same kind of kinematical or sort of mm -hmm. describing similar, similar physical systems? And just in, as, as a sort of, as an extension to that, perhaps um, considering the Einstein field equations as equations of state, is, is one way sort of subconsciously, I guess, of arguing that maybe, um, you know, the, the Einstein field equations construed as, as kinematical constraints give us a reason to think that this, these thermodynamical derivations um, tell us that, that GR is itself thermodynamics proper rather than a non-thermodynamical thing that j that's just formally analogous to, to thermodynamics. Right. So... It's no fair using my other work against me. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, actually, actually, I, actually, I think that it, um, actually, I think that I that what you're pointing to in this, in this other work I've done in a slightly different context, I think it actually meshes well with um, with, with at least with my attempt to analyze these arguments, because the, so in that other work, I argue that dynamics doesn't really t doesn't really contain have a lot of semantic content in the theory. It's really all in the kinematics. And this, I, I, I think that, in fact, that's a, that on um, the way I'm thinking about these, these programs, or tentatively trying to think about these programs, that's exactly what's going on. The, uh, all the relations one assumes uh, in the derivations are, in my sense of the term, they are kinematic. And one has to give them an interpretation, a thermodynamic interpretation. One has to justify the, their interpretation as thermodynamical, like, like, like I was sketching in response to Tom's question. And it's that, it's that initial move, saying these kinematic relations are already thermodynamical, that allows one to give the th thermodynamical interpretation to the, to, the, to, the, to the dynamic equation one derives. Or maybe not, or uh, as, as I say, there, there are two different ways that are conceptually distinct of thinking about what's going on. You derive, you derive a non-thermodynamical equation and give it a thermodynamical interpretation, or you simply derive a thermodynamical relation. In, I, in either case, that's well, that's going to work only insofar as one already has reason to think that yeah. the kinematics behind it is is thermodynamical to start with. So I don't think that there's actually a tension okay. here between stuff I've said elsewhere and and how I'm approaching the analysis of these arguments. So take that, <laughs> James. Okay, uh, Neil, you want to go with your second question? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I don't quite understand why we all call um, the field equations an equation of state. So if I think about it, um, so basically locally, yeah, at each point you have set up your, lo uh, your local Richter observer and so on, set up a uh, balance equation, right, which is somewhat dynamic, and you could say this is, so to speak, an equation of state. And then globally you assume that there's energy momentum conservation, uh, or in the sense of uh, um, the core derivative. And um, from this you could say that this tot total you get some kind of hydrodynamic system actually, right? Which is actually expressed by the field equation. So why go the way uh, call the field equations equation of state if not just the just the balance equation before was just the equation of state? And I don't know, I think it's much easier to interpret the whole results if more they somehow seem more invisible to interpretation if you think of the um, metric field as some kind of hydrodynamic field, the thermodynamic equation. So let me see. Um, so let me see if I understand the, the, the suggestion. You're saying that insofar as a lot of as a, as a lot of the justification for interpreting these ge these geometric quantities as thermodynamical in the first place, 
comes from the geometric, uh, the thermodynamical character of the matter fields that are giving that are giving rise to uh, to uh, to this non-trivial matter flux. That we should that shows that the that the Einstein field equation isn't so much an equation of state, whatever exactly an equation of state is, but should rather be thought of as a balancing equation. Is that correct? Oh, sorry, so basically like this. Um, so what I missed was somehow a mentioning of the word hydrodynamics. We always talk about thermodynamics here. So just if you take your hydrodynamic system to be more or less given by a conservation equation and by some kind of equation of state, right? Mm -hmm. Then in effect, we discover the same things uh, here in the case of Jacobs, right? We have locally at each point a kind of balance condition. And only if we apply the conservation equation, we get locally the feed equations, right? So I would rather um, yeah, be in favor of kind of um, calling the feed equations um, um, as a whole as some kind of hydrodynamic equation, which which has local equations of uh, equations of states. So I see where you're saying. Okay. So there's. I'm not sure why you want to say that in hydrodynamics we assume you know that we assume the continuity equation. We assume the energy conservation, and then the, the dynamical equations follow as balancing equations. That is not that can't be right, because I mean the Navier Stokes is not logically implied. Navier Stokes the, the dynamical Navier Stokes equations are not logically implied by continuity and uh, and energy conservation. One can't derive neighbor so the neighbor Stokes equations from uh, from those two conditions. One has to build in further substantive assumptions. Um, uh, if one's going to use the Boltzmann equation to do it, one has to build in further substantive assumptions about actually particular uh, properties of of the part of the particles themselves. So if that's if that's what you're talking about, then I then I don't think I don't think I agree with you that. That's, that that will be a useful way that that will be a useful analogy to draw. Dynamic fluid systems can be seen as being due to dynamics, uh, which come out of on the one hand equations of state, and on the other hand, uh, yeah, a set of conservation equations, not just energy, energy conservation, but also momentum conservation, mm -hmm. um, and so on. Um, yeah. And from given that picture, I would rather interpret the field equations as being under an dynamic equation. But okay, we can also discuss it some other but, point. But, 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 but no, I want to. I want to. I want to try. I want to see if I understand what you're saying. You're, if I understand you correctly, you're, you're saying that continuity, energy and momentum, and angular momentum conservation plus a particular equation of state, yeah. you can use that to derive, say, neighbor Stokes. But that's just false. Yeah, maybe not. I have to check this here. I'm not to go. Is he working it out on this? <laughs> he is, that's really cool. That's the white board there. Yeah. I'm waiting. Um, yeah, I mean, if I look, I mean, okay. I mean, let's talk about this. Why? Okay. Or, that's a, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have any more questions in Geneva? Okay. I don't think so. Is that, are there any other questions here? <laughs> so maybe. I, um, so let me. I'll ask one. Um, and yeah, okay. So it's really coming back to the point you made earlier on about them making an effectively making assuming a background metric to the system. Um, and my, part of my question is why that you mentioned that then, and that wasn't one of the things you said at the end when you were talking about problems. Um, and the other is why haven't they then just assumed that? It? <laughs> But they have an Einstein field equation solution, so why be surprised they can derive right. this? I mean, that's just what's sort of pregnant in the right. point you were so, making. There. Okay, uh, so uh, first question first: Why didn't I mention that in, when I was talking about technical or conceptual technical problems, conceptual issues? Well, um, I implicitly did. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of the technical issues that I raised 
exactly have to do with the fact that they're that that, that, that they're assuming this fixed metric. And given that they're assuming this fixed metric, how on earth do we know that there are things like like local render horizons and that we can define a notion of that there will be an appropriate notion of an almost filling field? I mean, the 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 problem of characterizing what it means to be approximately static, which means uh, that showing the existence of these approximately constant acceleration time like curves, which means showing the existence of an almost killing field, is a really fascinating one. And that's a real, I didn't go into it because I could talk, I could actually give an entire talk on, I actually have given an entire talk on that. So I, I the kind of thing you could write a dissertation about. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that, the, the issue of the metric is kind of built is is kind of built in on an underlying a lot of the specific problems I, I made. But I think just as um, as a point of, of exposition, I think you're right. I probably should draw that out explicitly if I give this talk again. The second question. Uh, what the hell? Is the second question. Well, why aren't they? If they're basically assuming that they have a solution oh, to right, the Einstein right, right. field equations, why okay. is it such a surprise? Right. Well, because uh, just assuming a metric doesn't that doesn't mean you're assuming the Einstein field equation. Because in fact, a lot they've done a lot of work. Uh, both Jacobson and Padmanabhan have attempted to show that their arguments extend into lovelock Langsos theories and into, and into a, a subset of FR theories and into a subset of quasi-topological theories. So just assuming a metric isn't assuming the Einstein field equation. You are, I mean, assuming the metric does mean, and the arguments they give these local linear horizons does does seem to imply something like metric plus something, some version of equivalence principle. And insofar as one can make precise what one means by some version of equivalence principle, one can argue convincingly that a lot of these, that a lot of these lovelock Langsos theories and a lot of these FR theories and all these quasi-topological theories don't satisfy that equivalence principle, don't satisfy that version of the equivalence principle. So that's problematic. Uh, but no, I, th I think that they really, that in their mind, and I think it's natural that, that they want to think of it this way. When they say derive the Einstein field equation, they really mean derive it. Because if there are deviations that might show that you know the better theory is Lovelos is Lovelos Langsock, Langsos <laughs> Lovelock, or FR or quasi topological, then that will show up presumably in observed deviations from you know fr from from setting GAB equal to TAB. So they're they're fixing the GAB. Okay, so then what they're doing is this is. It's going to show, but they're not assuming the TAB. I mean, they're assuming right. some things about TAB. They're, they're assuming some things about TAB, but they're not, not assuming they're what? not assuming that GAB equals TAB. Okay. They're so not that assuming is... that, that the matter couples in exactly that way. Okay. Okay. That, actually, that's great. Yeah. I think that's about. Are there more questions here, or that's usually about our sort of time. Um, is that good in Geneva? Did we, did we I don't think so. Hi. Hello? Uh, yeah. So we just did some more research uh, on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> All great questions <laughs> begin with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, I do see that um, well, I mean, there's a fluid dynamics equation, or problem of fluid dynamics is set up just by giving the mass, momentum, energy conservation equations plus an equation of state. Mm -hmm. Um, so that 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 is certain that is certainly true for the Euler equation, but it's not true for Navier Stokes. Ah, ah, okay. But I mean, you could make an analogy here to the to the Euler equation, then say in the case of uh, of Jacobs, and say, okay, following this analogy, one should follow the field equation as a result of local balance condition or equation of state and uh, conservation of energy momentum tensor. Um, yeah, a hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamic uh, equation or hydro uh, fluid light system. The problem, the again, I, 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 I think this is a very interesting suggestion, but the problem is that if you buy, for, you know, if you look at the work of you know Thorne and Price and McDonald and those guys on the membrane paradigm, the way to think about these uh, these causal horizons as hydrodynamic membranes is via Navier-Stokes, not via Euler, because they do have intrinsic viscosity. They have both shear and bulk viscosity. The, they have the analogs of shear and bulk viscosity. And so you really, if you want, I think if you're gonna to wanna to take this hydrodynamic analogy seriously, you're gonna to have to, you really are gonna to have to bite the bullet and say it's Navier-Stokes, not Euler. And then you're gonna need, you're gonna need something more for that derivation. Yeah, okay. I, 
I mean, I was thinking about it, but thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. perfect. Okay, well, I think it's time to wrap it up and thank Eric again for the talk and question session. And we'll see people in Geneva next week. Um, and remember, you guys have got to show up an hour earlier next week because our clocks are changing this weekend. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you then. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right.